Lecture 3, City as an Organism and the Idea of Emergence. When is chaos not chaotic? Uh, we look at physical living organism, uh, living systems, and we are mystified. And then science progresses and we delve the mysteries, plumb the, the, the depths of how these organisms operate, breaking it down basically into geometric designs and systems. Uh, so the distinction between the city as cosmos and city as machine and city as organism might be summarized as an issue of scale and complexity. Uh, and in that context, the city as organism uh, is really easily understood as many complex systems and geometries operating at a very small scale that uh, to the extent that the operation of those systems and those geometries are not immediately apparent and do not manifest in large geometric patterns as in the case of city as cosmos nor does their systematic relationship between the distinct components immediately become clear as in the city as machine and so uh, and you may get the impression uh, in the relationship between these three distinct uh, categories of phenomenon both in architecture and at the urban scale that uh, I am really down on the city as cosmos the diagram the large abstract geometric imposition on the planet um, that's not completely false but it would be wrong to uh, read what I am presenting as being that this should be eliminated. Far from it. What I'm promoting uh, instead is the idea that the lessons of history indicate that we must in all things strike a proper balance between the realm of large abstract diagrammatic patterns, the operation of systems, and a respect for the complex, seemingly complex forces that emerge uh, in through the process of uh, these, the operation of these different uh, systems, um, organisms, devices, relationships, etc. So, in the in the view here, uh, we see complexity. We might call it chaos, but if you understand the, at a more fine-grained level the operation of certain rules, in this case, the laws of Islam. Uh, suddenly you see uh, uh, an order to this pattern, uh, even if it's not a pure geometric order, there is uh, a, a set of relationships, a set of very concrete rules that uh, result in this pattern of formation. and. Uh, this, is, in a way, is one of the most interesting and challenging areas of visual analysis, uh, is delving into something that seems to be completely chaotic and finding order within it. Uh, in a similar way, scientists look at nature and the phenomena of swarm patterns, and it's very telling about who we are as a society and a culture that it's tempting for some people to believe that there must be some higher intelligence guiding uh, schools of fish, uh, flocks of birds, uh, swarms of insects. There must be some cosmic, supernatural, higher intelligence uh, that is simultaneously signaling to all of these separate organisms, separate individuals, what the greater good of their society might be. Uh, that's uh, more an indication of who we are than an indication of what is actually happening. As scientists suspend disbelief uh, and just go and see what the empirical data indicates, uh, looking for some reliable set of rules that might account for such behaviors, what they find instead is simply by understanding the rules uh, by which each of the individuals operate, they can account for the aggregate phenomena of all of those individuals uh, operating uh, 
uh, as a group. Uh, and in the case of locusts, for example, uh, locusts turn out to be cannibalistic. They are not high supernatural beings. Instead, they want to eat each other and they want to avoid being eaten. And this results in very specific rules uh, that are life and death uh, seriousness to the locusts uh, result in um, trying to not get eaten by the locust behind you and uh, trying to eat the locust in front of you. And swarm behaviors uh, can be explained to a large extent by simply modeling those algorithms. Uh, and notice I've switched my language in two ways. The first way is I take the point of view of the locust. This cuts to the heart of not just uh, effective attempts to understand the phenomena of the world, but the core of the ethical uh, obligations of professionals, especially architects. Um, this topic, uh, we, we look as an example, uh, the religion of Islam. Uh, how many of us are Muslims? I suspect uh, very few, if any. Yet, each and every one of us, in order to properly uh, pursue this topic effectively, uh, are obligated to a certain extent to place ourselves in the position of being a Muslim. And so I will say things like, in Islam, we must do this, or we must do that. I'm not imposing a religion on you. I am not even saying that I am Muslim. I am not a Muslim. Um, I am simply taking on the ethical voice of the professional architect and the effective uh, scholar. Any effective study of a phenomena uh, often requires us to take on the perspective of the subjects that are we are studying. Uh, and so I know that we are not locusts. I know that we are not fish. I know that most of us are probably not Muslim. And yet here we are talking as if we are locusts, fish, or Muslims to try to understand the phenomena and eventually as professional architects to attempt to perform uh, and fulfill the obligations of our profession effectively and ethically. Um, the other language uh, shift is the shift to computer science language of, and mathematics, of algorithms, of rules that are translated into hard and fast equations. Uh, this is something that architecture is moving into, and it is directly related to this topic of uh, complexity, the city as an organism, and the whole concept of emergence. Uh, it is an increasingly popular way of looking at the world, an increasingly useful way of looking at the world, especially in contrast to and as part of the recovery plan from the 20th century. Uh, we are faced with planetary death and uh, as the result of imposing uh, rigid diagrams upon the planet. And uh, the remedy is not to do that as much as we have in the past although the rigid diagram might play a very significant role in, in uh, addressing these issues. But uh, also we need to uh, increase our toolkit to look at the larger world of phenomena beyond the simple diagram, the rigid imposition of a geometry, or even the, uh, the disaggregated and distributed operation of large systems uh, to look at the world uh, as a world of emergent phenomena that by being sensitive to the forces uh, and phenomena of the world, we can harness those forces. We can understand those forces uh, sufficiently to uh, work in harmony with them, to uh, jujitsu them into doing something we want them to do. And the best example of that is the artwork uh, as seen here of Andy Goldsworthy, who starts his day walking out onto the landscape, uh, winter, summer, uh, no matter what the conditions, and simply sitting quietly in the proximity of nature, um, attempting to listen to uh, the, 
the voice of the natural phenomena around him, in this case of sticks, uh, in this case of ice. What does ice do? How can we take advantage of the freeze-thaw cycle that ice naturally constantly undergoes uh, to uh, channel the, that phenomena in a very deliberate way, nothing natural about it. This is deliberate man-made intervention into the natural world, uh, but working in harmony with a cooperative uh, relationship between natural phenomena and human intention to create something that had never uh, existed before and could not exist without both um, human intervention and uh, an understanding of natural forces and phenomena. Uh, in architecture, uh, we look for examples, and the world is filled with examples uh, that uh, are the exception that prove the rule. Instead of imposing an architectural form, uh, the architect instead has uh, decided to listen to the voice of complex phenomena and work in accordance with it. Here we are at the campus of Cornell University, upstate New York, Ithaca. Uh, a, a predictable condition. Uh, it's a more complex uh, equivalent of what we have uh, at Wentworth. Uh, where you have multiple buildings uh, and a lot of students, uh, staff and faculty uh, wanting to walk from one building to the next. And how do you accommodate that? Do you draw, do you locate every door facing the quad? Do you locate every gap between buildings uh, that lead onto the quad and draw a line? This would be the rational engineering approach. You simply design to accommodate every single possible path uh, uh, which quickly yields a spaghetti-like pattern of nothing but asphalt across the quad. Uh, and instead, the, the engineers and surveyors uh, at the moment of construction of the buildings around the arts quad decided to leave it muddy and let people walk across the muddy field and then evaluate which paths were most muddy. Uh, people walk, uh, voted with their feet, and wherever the most people walked, uh, that was the path that got uh, the paving. And wherever the paths were less popular, uh, as registered on the ground itself, that's where uh, the path was erased. Uh, and it turns out that you can convince a lot of people to take a different path simply by supplying or withholding uh, the paving for that path. And then the few uh, renegades who cross the grass, as long as there aren't too many of them, uh, the grass says uh, that's fine and it recovers quite well, thank you very much. And so uh, to the very present, uh, these paths have, um, have survived and persisted because uh, the pattern of human engagement with this uh, location has continued to follow a very similar um, pattern, uh, even with changes uh, to the quad, uh, such as Rem Kohlhaas's uh, new architecture building, uh, the paths uh, retain their usefulness. And so we turn now to the complexity of the uh, Muslim city. Um, apparently it's complete chaos, uh, no pattern, no rhyme or reason. No one designed this, um, or did they? Um, uh, very popular topic of visual analysis. Back in the day when we did uh, visual analysis from the top down, uh, the clearest pattern is the mosque itself, which uh, by uh, Islamic law and custom faces Mecca. The Kaaba, the the blank cube uh, in Mecca is the is the location of the center of the religion. Five times a day, uh, devout Muslims are obligated to face the Kaaba in Mecca uh, to pray, uh, and the ritualistic repetition of this event reinforces a, a diagram uh, imposed on the planet uh, that 
relates every location on the planet's surface to every other location via that central reference point in Mecca. Uh, and the obligation to travel there once in a lifetime on the Hajj uh, reinforces that a global geometric order. Uh, this is a diagram imposed on the surface of the planet in the nature of the city as cosmos. Um, but from there we depart quickly um, to more fine-grained uh, geometries. Here's another case where the mosque, no matter how powerful and strong the local grid, the mosque shifts one way or the other in order to face Mecca. Uh, in every hotel room in the world, increasingly, uh, there is a green arrow on the ceiling or somewhere in the room that indicates to the Muslim visitor which direction they must face uh, in their daily prayers. Um, here's a city in Africa where we see the relationship between the traditional city that grew uh, according to the laws of organic formation of the laws of Islam, the mosque at the center, and then uh, two distinct grids of later formation, um, likely under French uh, guidance, colonial um, planning, uh, accommodating the housing pattern uh, in its subsequent growth and development. Uh, you've probably seen uh, Lukan's uh, Dhaka Assembly Hall in uh, modern-day Bangladesh with the prayer hall that shifts off the axis subtly to accommodate the needs of uh, Islam in the non-denominational uh, spiritual hall uh, adjacent to the assembly. Uh, Klaus Herdeg uh, is one of is an architect um, who used to live in Boston, designed buildings here, but he was also a scholar of uh, Islamic cities uh, in Indian architecture uh, and applied a very sophisticated, powerful graphic technique based on the Noli plan uh, to the study of Islamic, uh, in this case, what we're going to be seeing many uh, examples of the drawings of his students at, when he was teaching at Columbia uh, that follows the principles of the Noli plan uh, approach. We're also uh, getting back into the material uh, presented by David McCauley to help us understand the distinct aspects of um, Muslim urbanism. Uh, the mosque uh, oriented towards uh, Mecca, um, the minaret or other location uh, very specifically uh, for the muezzin who uh, is responsible for signaling the, uh, that it is time to pray. And so you hear uh, hymns, uh, it's usually a hymn, but uh, increasingly that some women are taking on this role uh, in in some cultures. Uh, do give the call to prayer, uh, and uh, the part of the rules are that every uh, devout Muslim must live within uh, hearing distance of a muezzin's call at the mosque. Uh, the madrasa is the uh, Islamic school. Uh, often for just young men, uh, when they reach puberty, they move out of the home and move into the madrasa, where they study uh, uh, all, all topics uh, under the larger context and framing of Islam. Um, the imaret and the haman uh, and other urban elements uh, surrounding the mosque uh, also come into play the ulama, which is the uh, the society of the devout, uh, play a very important role in supporting the life of Islam around the mosque. Uh, in the original revelation of Prophet Muhammad, uh, it is uh, the urban setting plays a fundamental role in the uh, proper uh, life in Islam, and the ulama, the community of believers. Uh, that surround the mosque play a fundamental role. Uh, the marketplace, uh, the school, uh, all of these elements are, are dictated by certain guidelines uh, uh, given by the religion uh, for their proper arrangements. And this distinguishes Islam uh, in many ways from other world religions that are certainly Christianity, which are much less uh, 
obvious in their um, their relationship to the role played by the architecture and urban fabric. Um, when a, um, a mosque is laid out, um, the internal sanctuary um, is centered on the mihrab, where uh, the devout uh, face. Uh, adjacent to the mihrab is the location of, uh, in effect, the pulpit, where on Fridays at noon, the imam uh, offers a lesson, um, not so different from the Christian church, what happens on Sunday morning. Uh, the, there is a strict segregation of genders. Uh, women uh, might be off to the side behind a screen so as not to distract the men or up on a balcony. Um, and this rules, the rules about women and their distraction uh, include uh, the design of the home, the layout of streets, the, um, the, the orientation of window openings, uh, rooftop parapets, uh, dress and behavior in public, uh, dress and behavior and language in the home. All of these things, um, this is one of uh, the most influential um, aspects of Islamic law in terms of architecture and planning uh, of urban form. The courtyard fills up on Friday uh, with uh, because Friday is the big event. Um, people who would normally uh, pray at home uh, five times a day or in the local prayer hall at work or in the neighborhood around their home will come to the larger, the Friday mosque, uh, called such because it is larger than the local prayer halls, um, so as to accommodate the larger crowds that will spill out into the courtyard um, during the Friday prayers. The layout of both the mosque, the mosque precinct, the area around the mosque, are all governed by certain sets of uh, guidelines under Muslim rule, uh, rules of conduct. Uh, the minaret is where the muezzin uh, climbs five times a day to uh, give the call to prayer. Um, the a lot the in, one of the interesting aspects that is often overlooked about Islam is that at the moment of its uh, birth and proliferation, it was the most modern globalizing force uh, in the known world uh, because it uh, was specifically designed to overcome tribal factions, factionism. Uh, and it, so it was accommodating, it was radically accommodating of local cultural practices. So it did not dictate building form, it did not dictate a lot uh, things about local cultural aspects. It tended to um, favor accommodating local cultural variations of language, uh, not dress as much, um, but other things that uh, material cultural practices and became a unifying force uh, beyond tribal lines, uh, weakening the factionalism of local allegiances and created a very cosmopolitan, modern, forward-looking, progressive uh, establishment of social norms uh, that uh, were codified in the ninth century and uh, Currently, a lot of what we see going on in the pan-Islamic movements around the world is attempts to take the laws as they were frozen in the ninth century and impose them on uh, contemporary societies um, with varying degrees of success. But Islam is an extremely diverse uh, cultural set of cultural practices, often uh, accommodating local practices that had previously been established. Um, here are some of the building practices that were proliferated in Islam. The, the dome of the mosque, uh, the domes of the marketplace, um, uh, all of these building practices uh, have local uh, origins influenced by previously existing uh, local uh, customs. Islam uh, was established, the Prophet Muhammad, uh, in uh, the part of the world that is now uh, known as Saudi Arabia. Uh, and so many of the architectural uh, characteristics were of that time and place.
The uh, larger urban context uh, shows the madrasa in the foreground, uh, the mosque in, behind that, and off to the left we see the marketplace uh, and uh, that is a place of gathering uh, of great importance for not just the religious life, but uh, remembering that things were not so distinct. There wasn't a separation of church and state, um, that um, all these aspects of life were quite integrated together. Uh, and so we move on to Klaus Herdeg's work in the uh, documentation of Isfahan. In the spirit of the Noli map, uh, we see uh, very clearly called out those elements uh, that play a central role in the uh, the life of Islam uh, as distinct from the more residential quarters uh, surrounding it. And so we, we see um, only forms, indications of courtyard houses uh, surrounding uh, the other more central fabrics of market, mosque, school, um, all of these elements, the street, um, given by uh, Islamic law. And so this is the the town uh, of Isfahan uh, in present-day uh, Iran, uh, an amazing um, uh, place, uh, an amazing, a very rich um, piece of architecture. And so uh, Herdeg and his students studied several different uh, cities uh, of Islam, uh, Isfahan, Samarkand, Bukhara, and Kiva, and um, uh, documenting, really very closely related to the work uh, that we're doing, documenting and figure ground the historic uh, growth of these places, um, how they changed over time, uh, and really trying to make sense of the patterns and forms that they find embedded uh, in the architecture on the ground. Here you see an historic uh, progression uh, as the fabric and support of Islam uh, develops in the previously existing uh, city. Um, we don't have time to go in, in depth in each of these, but the um, instead it probably makes sense uh, to study this mode of architectural documentation to understand uh, the strengths and weaknesses, the pros and cons, uh, what it is doing well. Um, this is quite similar to uh, the work of uh, Weldon Priest and his students. Uh, you can see their work uh, on Istanbul, also uh, an Islamic city fabric, um, the area around Hagia Sophia, which was originally a Christian church, as you know. Um, uh, but the mosques uh, of that part of the of Istanbul is uh, on display in the headquarters of the architecture department uh, for at least the next few weeks. Strongly recommend taking a look at how those drawings compare with these drawings. Um, the techniques of figure ground uh, are then uh, developed further in axonometric studies. Uh, that give a stronger three-dimensional sense of the place. Uh, here's what the uh, actual presence of this architecture looks like. Uh, there was a, a mandate in Islam, or at least as it was interpreted, against figurative uh, representations. So uh, uh, people, especially the prophet, uh, are are forbidden to be represented in the artwork and em embellishment of the architecture. And so it tends to favor geometric patterns, often deriving from uh, Arabic script of uh, Quranic verses um, represented in the architecture. Here's an example of uh, an axonometric section where uh, an axonometric uh, is shown is cut away to show the spatial character, quality, and experience happening within. Um, here's a photograph uh, from above of that fabric, and uh, maybe you can actually place yourself uh, in this uh, in this context. Um, the figure ground drawing again favoring the open spaces, the courtyards of the residential fabric. 
and the open floor plans of the more publicly accessible uh, structures. Uh, kind of the magical um, dematerialization of the surfaces, uh, similar to what one would experience in a Gothic cathedral. And here are some of my favorite drawings where uh, below we see uh, a horizontal section cut through the axonometric and then we see uh, then it's lifted above and so now what we're seeing here is a worm's eye view horizontal section axonometric where we are looking up towards the ceilings and really getting a reading of the formal experience of these vaulted forms of the um, the mosque. Here you see the marketplace, um, the covered street, a uh, series of domes. If you look back at the first image of the lecture, you can immediately see the market street uh, running through that fabric in the photograph, and here get a sense of what the relationships between that market street might be with uh, the market stalls. Um, here a close-up um, of that relationship. And here's uh, the marketplace uh, as experienced. Quite wonderful, magical uh, experience. Uh, if you get a chance to take Weldon Priest's uh, travel studio in, um, in the graduate program, it is a chance of a lifetime to get to Istanbul uh, and study it with his uh, insights. Um, more of these uh, axonometric, not axonometric, but figure ground uh, representations that show in the spirit of the Noli plan uh, those areas that are accessible to the public uh, as opposed to the private spaces that are not accessible. Uh, the larger fabric of the city represented in axonometric. Uh, and then uh, the relationship between the section and the plan of this very complex house um, of, a, of a prominent citizen uh, showing the, a very elaborate relationship of the courtyards that you see here. Uh, the inward facing courtyards, the zero lot line party wall system uh, in which uh, all windows face inward, all light, natural light comes from the courtyard every face of the courtyard is a permeable uh, uh, threshold membrane uh, that uh, gives onto private spaces within the home or the mosque. Uh, here's another one, uh, very elaborate, where every room has an opening that opens onto a courtyard. And uh, some of the, um, the screening strategies that create and maintain privacy uh, especially at the ground level, but also on the upper level, women were uh, restricted to certain areas of the house, uh, including the upper levels, where uh, it would be it was easier to restrict the view into the upper level uh, from the street and from other homes, um, such that um, the privacy uh, could be maintained. And here we see uh, a of examples of simpler, more modest homes where these same strategies uh, are deployed, uh, each taking a different, a slightly different form. Uh, and so the rules embedded in this uh, architectural form can be discerned uh, and interpreted uh, uh, in both directions. So you can start from the architecture and uh, create a codification of the rules, or you can start from the rules and understand how that might result in a multiple different ways, uh, multiple different architectural manifestations, all following those rules. Um, I make a connection between uh, this tradition of courtyard housing and the architect Jeffrey Bawa of Sri Lanka, one of the great masters of 20th century architecture uh, from uh, Sri Lanka, an island nation south uh, east of uh, of India. Uh, this is his home, which is one of the more brilliant examples of an inward-facing domestic architecture, uh, where every room uh, faces on to at least one courtyard, uh, which even though there is a wall surrounding the entire house, 
there is a sense of openness uh, from every room that makes it feel very connected to nature. And in so doing, um, satisfies a lot of the ambitions of the American dream, the American way of life, the cultural norm of the single family house in the United States. But uh, achieving that uh, by employing the opposite formal relationship between the home and the uh, context. Instead of putting an object in the middle of uh, an open piece of land, as we do in the United States in the tradition of single family suburban housing, this is a case where uh, you place an open, an opening in the center of what is, for all intents and purposes, a house. Uh, so you poke holes in the house and create a similar relationship between inside and outside, um, but through different means and with a much higher performance in terms of privacy. Of course, that would be illegal in most locations. Um, which brings us to the topic of zoning codes. Uh, it's quite interesting to look at examples where the zoning codes uh, uh, are, are the rules by which things and, and building codes. So zoning codes and building codes uh, uh, are what we experience as a close equivalent to what we're talking about in the Islamic world. Um, a note about the reading, uh, it's a massive reading uh, and you should not read the reading. You should instead set a timer, give yourself a time limit, dive in, extract the rules that are given in the reading and uh, get out um, before your timer rings. Um, do not read the whole thing. Go in and find the key rules that are uh, presented in this long chapter and uh, write about those key rules. And it, you, should, you should capture it, the four most important rules at a minimum uh, that you can find in there. Um, if you want to codify them mathematically or verbally or in a sketch, that's all great. I don't know if you can upload sketches scanned into the text box, but I believe you can this year. You could not last year, but I think they fixed that for us. Um, also, take note of the uh, political organization implied in this. They, they, the chapter um, points out how the administrative arrangements work. There is no central authority. Uh, there is more of a cultural uh, self-organizing uh, process that is implied in these guidelines, um, which is, makes for a very interesting thing. And I want you to comment, uh, study that and comment on that. So the two things are a minimum of four rules plus uh, a comment on what the author is saying about um, self-organization and uh, your thoughts on that. Um, moving forward, we're looking at Kuwait City, which was um, the birthplace of one of my students in a former version of the class uh, who made this very um, powerful uh, term project uh, looking at his, where he was uh, born and raised. You see uh, an Islamic city, an example of an Islamic city that uh, developed under the very extreme influence of mid-20th mid century American norms, um, located uh, at the pinch point between Iraq, Iran, and Saudi Arabia. A great, uh, this is the entire nation of Kuwait. Uh, it's really Kuwait city and the desert surrounding it, plus a port. Um, here it is from above. We zoom in, you see the concentric circles of its um, road system, very American. Move in towards um, his uh, neighborhood, and we start to see um, the, the prayer, the, the mosque at the center of his block, um, the organization of houses according to a very Americanized urban set of considerations, but still the houses themselves uh, have the zero lot line and they have some version of a courtyard uh, in the center of each house uh, where the windows face. So they are still following very much the laws of Islam against um, uh, viewing into someone else's house from the rooftop or across uh, open space uh, with windows. And so uh, it is uh, an ongoing 
practice, building practice of following these guidelines. There was a brief moment in um, documented in Riyadh, uh, Saudi Arabia, where the American influence, uh, there was a sense of in order to be modern, uh, let's have setbacks like they do in America. And so for a couple of years, they had a new set of building codes and requirements that you could not build up to the lot line. You had to stay back um, uh, some setback distance uh, with buffers. And uh, and the result was uh, not so great. Uh, people put windows in those walls uh, facing across that very narrow buffer zone and immediately uh, came into conflict with uh, the laws of Islam. And it was, um, to make a long story short, it was an utter and complete disaster. They immediately abandoned it. And the new project of the architects of Riyadh was to uh, develop uh, in a very contemporary modernist idiom of architectural design, but in ways that um, complied with the traditions of Islamic uh, formation, especially in regard to privacy of the home. And so there was an outpouring of uh, very interesting work where architects uh, following the traditional laws of Islam created multifamily dwellings, not uh, you know, which is more difficult uh, in terms of maintaining privacy and maintaining an efficiency of layout. But it was a very interesting project that yielded some very um, good work uh, in, in the region. Um, we move now to uh, other systems, other uh, architectural uh, endeavors that deal with the idea of the city as an organism. We move here to a group of architects who, in the middle of the 20th century, broke away from the central, uh, the central uh, thrust of modernist architecture, specifically the uh, International Congress for Modern Architecture, or SIAM. Uh, you heard it uh, before uh, in class, and probably last year, even if you don't remember it. Um, SIAM was the central authority international organization for developing and promoting the aspirations of modern architecture all over the world starting in 1927. Uh, they wrote the Athens Charter in 1933. We'll be looking at that later in the semester. And the Athens Charter became the, um, the Quran, the Bible for post-war development in the wake of World War II in countries all over the world. Even as uh, the Athens Charter was uh, taking over uh, the sense of how to build cities and architecture everywhere, a group of young architects uh, that became known as Team 10 uh, were uh, not just radical um, offshoot of Siam. They basically, and with Corbusier's approval, took over Siam, and they led... Uh, the the Siam 10. So to Corbusier's credit, he support, supported these, these young Turks, these radicals uh, from several different European nations, um, including England. Uh, and basically, they were pushing back hard against Corbusier's four functions of the city, uh, which has yielded so much destructive influence around the world, and instead called for uh, an a better understanding or building according to, instead of the four functions, uh, the four scales of human association. Uh, and so the four scales are the house, the street, the district, and the city. And they made the point that at the level, the scale of the house, we're doing quite well, thank you very much, architects have that covered. But at these other three scales, uh, there was a great deal of uh, missed opportunity. And uh, the one they focused on was the scale of the street. And they encouraged architects to move from the scale of uh, single houses or single buildings to the scale of uh, streets or the complex assemblies of different buildings. And in this, they were guided by a larger uh, biological uh, principle, something that came out of uh, the study of landscapes and biological systems, um, Patrick Geddes was a biologist uh, in the uh, late 19th, early 20th century, 
and he turned his attention to uh, architecture and planning and became one of the most influential designers uh, in his proposals for cities uh, as implemented in several cities around the world, uh, especially in England and in uh, India. And so Patrick Geddes brought the principles of biological sciences, including the valley section, uh, where there's he proposes a very um, organic relationship uh, between the features, uh, common features of uh, topography with the, the uh, resonant opportunities for human settlement patterns. So in the base of the valley where the river flows, where our largest human settlements uh, develop because of the transportation issues or of the waterways, the ease with which roads and railroads are built in the bottom of valleys. Um, up from the river uh, is where he locates uh, industrial uh, development and then further up um, uh, housing uh, of different densities, uh, yielding eventually to the wilderness. Uh, yes, it's a great simplification, uh, but uh, a useful, informative one nonetheless, um, if, as long as we um, acknowledge the limitations. The other principle that was brought into uh, design and architecture from biology is the idea of the transect. Originally in biology, a technique by which you <clears throat> map out a slice, sometimes an arbitrary slice, across the landscape. And within each sector of that slice, uh, the scientists count the number of species or document the num quantify the number of this or characterize the character of certain landscape issues and thereby take the measure of the distinct zones and find and identify and categorize uh, the, the distinct zones that might exist in that area. That principle of the transect, the section across the landscape uh, and characterizing the different zones is what produced the valley section. And uh, here it is uh, as laid out by uh, biology uh, and the idea of human activities and economics uh, according to that. Uh, it was brought in, um, resonated with the work of Ian McCarg, one of the great uh, progenitors of the field of landscape architecture. Here's his book uh, called Design with Nature, 1977, that has taken on a new life and importance in the context of global challenges, where the shoreline is characterized according to the ideas of the transect as distinct uh, ecological zones each with their own characteristics and each calling for their own design approach in terms of um, transformations of the built environment by designers and the activity of humans. Uh, a similar approach was taken uh, here in Roger Transick's um, Finding Lost Space and his analysis of uh, a Scandinavian city. Uh, and more recently, um, Andres Duani, um, the arrogant, uh, obnoxious progenitor of new urbanism, pretending that he invented the whole thing. Um, here he is uh, presenting the transect, which despite his, um, his limitations as a human being, is actually quite a useful uh, tool for understanding how cities might work and a provocative proposal to replace uh, the complex, uh, rigid, dysfunctional zoning requirements uh, handicapping cities all over North America and the world, uh, a proposal to displace that with something that works much more effectively um, uh, in these, this is the transect uh, idea that he proposes. Back to Team 10, uh, they owed a great deal of their insights um, to Corbusier, but um, they also identified Corbusier's shortcomings uh, and uh, with apparently Corbusier's support um, helped refine and develop a much more effective set of principles uh, through deeper study based in anthropology uh, of human settlements. Uh, the great uh, Aldo van Eyck from the Netherlands uh, 
also uh, was part of this Team 10 group um, who probably had the strongest connection to anthropological studies in Africa. Here we see a proposal uh, for the outskirts of the French city of Toulouse, uh, where the principles, here you see these forms that um, might be called organic if we're um, not careful about language, uh, and for lack of a better term, it appears to not be the rigid geometric order um, that we're used to seeing architects produce, but uh, a more emergent set of forms uh, based on certain principles and guidelines and rules, not so unlike um, that of the Islamic city. Uh, and here we look at it closer. The, the realm of the street is the place where the Team 10 architects felt uh, design needed to make some progress. And that in, in that, it was a very prescient uh, uh, insight that predicts what we are increasingly looking at in the present uh, conditions. And they made proposals based on that for pedestrian, elevated pedestrian realms uh, in cities across Europe, um, which is a very difficult thing to pull off because vertical um, movement off of the ground plane uh, historically has led to failures. Um, it is a very unlikely thing to pull off, but the attempt is instructive and it's interesting. Uh, finally, we look uh, this this idea of uh, emergent form based on very localized rules helps us uh, delve more effectively into the phenomena of informal settlements. Uh, currently, one billion of the globe's seven billion people live in these informal settlements. And as we move from seven billion to 10 billion, it will increase from one billion to three billion. So we're adding three billion people to the population in your lifetimes. And two of those three billion people will live in informal settlements. Sorry about that. Uh, but it's important to understand the forces uh, behind the forms that are taking shape and to figure out, uh, once you figure out what's going on, um, to critically evaluate what is good about that and what is bad about that and what to do about it from a design standpoint.